I'm Dustin Adcock. Um, I'm a local foods and commercial horticulture agent. I'm actually an a and agent. Um, and I do a region of Anson, Stanley, and Union County. Um, and just a little background that I think is kind of pertinent to what I'm talking about, market channel analysis, is that um, for about 12 years, I have either operated a CSA, uh, community supported agriculture, uh, subscription type program for produce, or um, have owned one. And I've owned one for going on eight years, and I kind of did both for a little while. And so a lot of this is kind of my common sense applied to those that really know what they're talking about. Um, I'm an agent. I took on a task from uh, the local foods graduate course that I was participating in, um, where essentially they wanted a package presentation that other agents could use to help them understand better ways to uh, navigate this market channel analysis conversation. And so you're going to see basically today, I'm going to walk you through what I created as somewhat of a packaged presentation. Um, there's two studies that I got from Rebecca uh, Dunning and, uh, and through that class that were out offered as uh, some added materials and reading. And that's the uh, LaRue study, and I've got it in the PowerPoint with the um, full um, reference there so you can look it up later in, in the Hardesty study. So you're gonna hear me refer to those, try and make sure and give them credit. So I guess the um, most pertinent thing is to start off with um, what, is market, what is a market channel? And essentially it is a um, imaginary line or process, if you will, of where the product originates to the end user. And um, I guess one of the reasons this interested me a lot, and I was kind of taken when they asked me to present on it because um, I, I don't know that I have my brain wrapped around the uh, perfection of this process. It just seems like such a difficult task for every farmer, every person I've worked with. It's such a difficult conversation to try and figure out how are they gonna move their product. And I don't know how many of you've heard um, as uh, in your positions, some farmer or some producer come up to you and say, you know, I wanna grow this. Um, and we're told, you know, the first thing you ask them is where are you gonna sell it? But I kind of feel cruel in doing that because I grow and I often grow things that I'm still trying to figure out how to better move or sell. And um, so it's almost like we say, we say that because we're told that, but we really don't know um, why. Uh, as we look at it, we're gonna, you know, we all know wholesale and retail for the most part, and it gets kind of complicated in the produce world because oftentimes wholesale is then wholesaled to someone else. And so it can get kind of complicated or somebody takes something they see as retail and they don't even realize the person buying it's going to further process it or take it to another uh, degree and, and essentially make their product a wholesale. Um, and I think there's a figment of people's imagination that selling to a retailer is success. I don't know if anybody else, you can raise your hand if you've had that experience, but somebody who says, I sold, you know, 10 boxes of tomatoes to Harris Teeter last month, and I have some farms that really, I mean, that's their success story. They have no idea what profit was in it. It was just like, hey, I made it in Harris Teeter, so I'm successful. Um, and then we have other people that hang their hats on a lot of other things. And for me, a long time I uh, hung my hat on my CSA, but I'll be honest with you, the first four or five years of operating a CSA, I'm pretty certain I was not successful um, in an economic sense. I just enjoyed it, and so I kept kind of jading myself as to its profitability. <clears throat> so sometimes in, uh, we'll, we'll refer to the retail sales as uh, direct sales, but I think that could be a little more, and, and you might could speak to that more, but to me that's a little oversimplified. Um, 
because direct sales often in our world, we're thinking in terms of policy. So we think of direct sales as off the farm, for instance, for meat, whereas selling at the farmer's market, we wouldn't say is direct sales because maybe it had, uh, you know, it had come from another farm. We have a meat handler's license and we're actually selling somebody else's meat, so it wasn't direct. Does that make sense? Um, but for today's discussion, we'll, we'll kind of use them interchangeably. So we have this kind of, uh, Rebecca, <laughs> give her credit there, this uh, description or, or analysis of the two different um, types of selling, the two avenues. And each one has its own, um, its own benefits, its own uh, issues and, and uh, challenges. Um, but I think what you'll notice if, I mean, these are the kind of black and white examples, but you'll find a lot of these are really kind of blurred between the two. Um, for instance, uh, one of the best examples I can think of is these buying clubs. A lot of the buying clubs now are um, being formed to provide for retailers. And so there are actually uh, some chefs in Charlotte region that come together and have created kind of a buying club to help supply their restaurants. And so it's really, it's a, it's a buying club, but it's really in the wholesale marketplace. Um, I don't know if anybody else has had examples, but I know a lot of these kind of get blurred. And uh, I think, you know, some of these are the ones that, and I don't mean to be critical, but Again, institutions are something that we're talking a lot about, and we really want this farm to school. But the reality is that um, it just doesn't fit a lot of people. And it's just when you start talking to food service uh, folks, it, I'll be honest with you, I just don't have a farm in my region that makes a lot of sense for an institution yet. I really want it, but I've realized that I'm pushing people that just don't fit it. Um, I hope that changes, but right now I don't have that person I could say this person should be supplying. We, we talked just briefly about some possibilities, but they've got some, they've got some learning and some decisions to make as a business before they'll be ready to supply an institution, in my opinion. You're saying that because of the size of their operation or, or just the availability, their ability to consistently provide product, product quantity? Or um, it, well, it's a myriad of things, but I think one of the bigger issues is people not deciding, we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute, but people not deciding to focus on one or two things that they could scale and take it to an institution. They like the diversity, and so they just can't make the decision as to what that item is. And um, I, I think that's a bigger one uh, that we don't talk a lot about, but I think a lot of farms just really don't like the idea of growing three things. Um, it's too similar to big ag in, in their world. Um, and there's a lot of people that argue that the sweet potatoes in their child's lunchroom is not local foods because it's big production of sweet potatoes. And so you've got that kind of uh, issue. But then the other thing is, um, in our area is labor force. Um, it's easier to have, I shouldn't say easier, for some people, it's more feasible to have multiple folks with small production of this, you know, of 10 different items and spread that labor demand out over the entire year versus having one or two crops that they've got to get in all at once and they don't have 30 folks to hire at a reasonable wage. And that's a big issue for us. I know it is across the state, but um, in our region, the poultry industry dominates by a long shot and they yank up pretty much all the lower waged um, labor force that we have. So it's, it's extremely difficult. Um, but that's a good question. Um, so the next really, you know, I think the most, I wouldn't say the most, but one of the most difficult conversations to have is about these variables that we were kind of just alluding to and I think right here, and this actually comes from uh, LaRue, the LaRue study had created this kind of uh, 
if you will, analysis of, of how can you determine whether you should be more retail or more wholesale. And they pick these variables to focus on. And um, I think you could add a bunch to this, but these are the easier ones to, to discuss in a professional sense without people really having to self-examine too much. Um, it's difficult um, to tell somebody which one of these uh, they're missing the mark on. I don't know if you've had those experience, but I've had some people that just can't, they just can't self-evaluate. When they look at, for example, uh, I think price is an easy one. Um, it seems like it's just polarized. We have people that really want affordable food and then they just, they cannot convince themselves to charge enough to stay in business. And then we have the others that feel like they are such a cut above that if they aren't 200% of regular retail, then they're not profitable. And it's a difficult thing to talk about because a lot of times this price they've stuck with for a while and they're very comfortable with, and they feel like you are painting them as somebody they're not if you start touching that. I don't know if you feel that, but um, the certified organic growers that I have, that's a big one that they almost, I feel like they almost think I'm insulting them to recommend larger quantity and a lower price um, in some instances because they have put themselves in the situation where when they're at the market they compare their, their value and their quality of their product based on the price that they demand and that they're getting for it and what they can't see is that price is what's keeping them from it could be what's keeping them from a greater market okay um, or maybe they need to go the opposite direction and they, they're in the wrong market and, and they need to, to better diversify and better, um, what's the word? Um, they, they need to carve out a, a better niche for themselves that they can keep that premium. But um, <laughs> the one that I jokingly deal with more than anything is just people that aren't people, persons, people, people, <laughs> whatever you want to say. Um, and I find that when there are a lot of people that enjoy other, they enjoy other people having their food, enjoying their food, talking about their food. It excites them. And I'm one of those people. Nothing makes me happier than somebody to, you know, send me a message on Facebook and say that was the most amazing head of lettuce I've ever had. That excites me. That's why I do it. But I find that a lot of these people that like the customer interaction don't like other farmer interaction. And that makes it a difficult place at a farmer's market because um, th there's tension on it. If they see anybody else getting that same feedback, then somehow it degrades what they're doing. You know, they thought they were the only one that could grow that head of lettuce like that. Um, and I think there's a lot of personal deep-rooted deep issues that are difficult to talk to uh, someone about, but you might help ask questions about how they like interacting with other farmers. Um, if you start talking about a farmer's market, uh, and I work with several farmer's markets, if you start talking about a farmer's market, you'll find that almost every vendor has had a bad experience at another farmer's market. And often I think it's more the other vendor interactions that they were having issues with than it was really the market. Um, and sometimes it's just uh, the people that liked their stuff aren't the same type of customer at another market. Um, and they, they don't understand why they don't have the same successes. Does that make sense from my talking in circles? I don't, I don't want to drag it out too long. Um, now, I think one of the, the best ones that we could really help folks with is post-harvest handling. Um, the average um, grower that I work with has fairly poor post-harvest handling. And when I'm talking post-harvest handling, I'm talking about their packaging, their, uh, whether or not they're gonna wash, how they're gonna label or identify that product, how it's gonna be stored. Um, and a lot of times, truthfully, I think the reason a lot of our market is direct market is because of this, more so than the rest. That's just my personal take on it. I find that more people are not willing to invest because it's hard to see the direct relationship to a large scale walk in cooler and the value it's going to bring their business because it's a big investment. Um, so it's easier to have, and, I, and I'm one of those, 
the CSA, one of the best things about a CSA is you pick it, you put it in a bag, they pick it up. It, the post-harvest is not so important. Um, and the people learn to love you, and so they're more forgiving. Okay, they, they build a relationship with you. Um, if you take that same product to a retail store, yours is compared against everything else. They don't really care how big a smile you got on your face when you dropped it off. Your strawberries didn't last but three days last week. And so there's a big issue. Um, so I think this one is one that extension, especially with the GAP certification um, and the standards coming um, to be a little more of common ground for folks and people are more aware of it and they're more, uh, I feel like they're becoming a little more open to that conversation. Um, a lot of that's gonna be hinged on how willing they are to invest in some post-harvest um, equipment. So then uh, another great little diagram here from LaRue is to put it in this chart based on um, a consideration for how much, how much diversity you want on your farm and then the scale and the size of the farm and what I find is that in my own, the way I related to this is in my own work, um, this, this one doesn't seem to affect the farmers. The, the scale or the size of the farm doesn't seem to affect the farmers uh, like it should. I find that there are people who have 10 acres of production. 10 acres of produce is a lot of produce. And they're still growing 40 crops because they've determined that their best success in life has been, and I hate to keep using the CSA, but their best success has been their roadside stand or their CSA. And the reason it was successful is because they had so much to offer. So the most obvious thing is to just grow more of everything, right? So they just keep scaling and they keep scaling, they keep scaling, and then they burn out. And they either sell out or they get fed up, something else, it was always something else's fault, you know, the taxes were too high or whatever their reasoning. But I really think a lot of that hinges on this, um, getting this concept into people's mind. When I talk to a new grower, one of the first things I do is tell them to only give me five crops that they're willing to take to market. Because I find that for, that boggles most of their minds. Most of them that have decided they're a farmer overnight have envisioned these fields just packed with all of nature's bounty, right? And um, I don't expect them to have five crops, but I think that's a good challenge for them to try and get themselves down to five crops and then think about the seasonality of each crop and when it's going to be ready and what kind of money it's going to bring, what kind of demands it's going to have. Um, one of the best examples I have of this, and uh, I need to move quite quickly, but one of the best examples I have of this is a, a farmer that I work with in Stanley County who for years has operated a corn maze. Um, he's quite successful with it. Um, and it was a very smart move on his behalf because he does greenhouse tomatoes the other part of the year and he does strawberries. And so spring and winter is pretty busy for him. He's putting tomatoes in the house in December and January. He's got strawberries that go in in September, but really they're, the thick of their labor is in you know January, February, March uh, building up to harvest. And so after talking to him, he was really looking at expanding and going to more farmers markets. And what I prodded him on was, you know, who's going to run to these markets? How much more are you going to have to have of everything? And how difficult is your time and your management now? Okay, so you're just wanting to amplify. That's your answer is to just amplify. So for him, the answer I think we found that seems to work well is we started using his summer fields for um, sunflowers and for pumpkins because he's got such a draw in the fall that people wanted to come out and have weddings in this field of sunflowers. He's got a photographer he's lined up that comes out and does family shoots. He found him a local guy that would harvest the sunflowers so they come in and cut it and everything for him. And then the pumpkins were just nostalgic for the time of year in the um, and for the corn maze. And the kicker is he leaves, he pulls him out of the field, he puts them on these pallets and he sets no price and he does everything based on uh, the honor system. And it's unbelievable what people will pay for these pumpkins because they drive their kids out. So it was just a real simple change for him. 
Um, and it all started because we were looking for a cover crop. And we kept looking for a cover crop, you know, trying to figure out what, um, what time of year and, and what he could squeeze into his growing. And the more obvious thing was to cover the ground with pumpkins um, and, and have him some value there. So I think that was an example where he was, he's at about 40, 30, 40 acres, something like that. But his, his diversity had started to creep up where he had a little bit of lettuce, a little bit of cabbage, a little bit of onions, a little bit of everything. So we kind of scaled that down and we focused more on what he could do at a larger acreage. So then I took that kind of a step further to help my farms understand it. And I just kind of created this um, scale, if you will. And what I was help, trying to get people to understand is as you think in terms of diversity and scale, um, let that play a part in, in trying to decide how much direct sales you want to do, how much wholesale, because I, I find very seldomly does one farmer pick one or the other. It's usually a hybrid. Um, and so helping them understand that as they have more acreage, they need to go. And it seems obvious, but I've been amazed at how many farms have looked at this and said, oh yeah, I hadn't thought about that. You know, I keep, I keep I'm, I'm in retail and my answer to everything has, to been, has been more acreage. We need to buy more land. They, some of them have two and three farms and they just keep adding on. Um, sorry, I was walking away with the microphone there. But um, so I think for me, this was kind of an easy way to have that conversation with somebody and ask them seriously with all that we've considered so far, where on this pendulum do they find themselves? And maybe that answer is less acreage actually. Um, maybe it would be neat to see how much you could produce on one acre instead of 10 acres. Um, so uh, I think the next uh, st is everybody good at this point? Do you have any questions, thoughts, something you want to add to the group? You've probably had more experiences than I have, I know for sure. Um, one of the uh, Follow, actually, I think this is um, pretty far along, actually, in, in the LaRue study, in their report. Um, but they did this neat little, um, I guess it was more of a case study. I can't remember if they duplicated it. Uh, do you remember? I, I can't remember. But basically what they did is they took uh, strawberries based on the farmer's market as a more retail direct sales and the grocery store as wholesale and they compared to figure out even though based on the sale price that was seemingly higher um, how often did those things come back actually um, being more profitable and that's something that I've learned um, this is just me personally I find that if somebody doesn't really get this it's a very hard thing to convince them of they just tomorrow will be a better day and they will sell more at $4. They didn't do well this Saturday at the farmer's market and they only made $144, but tomorrow is gonna to be my $800 day. Um, and I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but I think it is a good conversation piece is to say, how many, have you calculated how many it would take you to equate one drop off at a local grocery store? And the truth is, I don't know, has anybody else worked with uh, any of the purchasers or uh, any other distributors as far as buying produce? Um, I don't know if, you're exi if, if your situation is the same, but Harris Teeter and, and Lowe's Food both are really interested in direct sort, store sales. They, they want farms to take directly to one, two, three, four stores. And, um, I was surprised because for forever MDI has wanted everything to go through Hickory, but now they're talking even about direct to store. Maybe that's because we're kind of out of their region, and so maybe they don't they don't want to invest in that extra travel. I don't know. It's actually the uh, freshness of the product. Okay. Okay, that's a good point. And also to have the relationship with the growers so that like Lowe's or Harris Teeter is having a local event, 
No, we we'll uh, make sure you is know. having a local event. Then they like to have you know a farmer farmers come in, so then they can have that kind of relationship with them. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that would be a, another big thing. Yeah, and I know uh, Harris Teeter, one of the uh, the purchaser that I was dealing with, one of his comments was that um, corporate is becoming less and less aware of what different stores desire, and and they're aware that the produce manager probably has a better feel for what the customers, what, what the direction is that the customers are going. And so they're kind of going backwards to more of a model of the produce manager has the final say. Um, and now Walmart has not considered direct uh, to store sales that much, but even they in our region has just recently started saying that they would, uh, they would at least acknowledge that concept, um, which is, funny because we have a distributor for Walmart 30 minutes from us so um, so I guess my point is that this very well in the future could be a pretty promising opportunity for some fairly small growers because as this example shows depending on what you're selling if you're in strawberry business 300 quarts of strawberries can come quite quickly um, you'd be shocked at how quickly you can find yourself with an excess of strawberries and so um, it's difficult because I can guarantee you when you start talking a buck 50 for a quart to a strawberry producer, they're not fond, very fond of that idea. Um, but I can tell you this, I have two or three growers that I know have been doing a lot of freezing lately. And I can guarantee you those strawberries are not gonna be worth much more than a dollar 50 a quart when they're done. So it, it's, it's worth considering for some. Um, so as the, Price is up, the volume's down, and we this is kind of a general concept of economics, and then volume is up, price is down um, as a whole, but that's not always the case. Um, as you work with some of these purchasers, you'll find, I think, uh, there are some specific products that they want that they are a lot less concerned about price on, and the store wants them uh, just for the fact that it's not worth trucking in. It's a small quantity, and they want it in their store because they know there's a, an average or decent demand for it. Um, I'm finding that the, the stuff that the stores are interested in is uh, often surprising to me. I'm almost never right when I think I know what they want. Um, I talk to a purchaser, and he tells me the exact opposite, and it's something very unique and specific, and... Um, I think they're really trying to find creative ways to make their model make sense. And the big items that we often talk about, the corn and the squash and the tomatoes and those things, they've, they've got pretty well uh, established channels for those. Um, so they're less interested in that. Um, well, the GAP certification is, is a big one. Um, people are still scared of that. Um, it, it's really hard in our area to even talk about it to a lot of growers. They're getting better, but I still think it'll be a while before we see a bunch jump on. Um, but I think the other thing is um, the ones that I have had do direct to store uh, delivery have had mixed feelings of the results. Um, and some of it was because of the item that they had. And sure, they sold, you know, 300 of something, and it, it made sense on paper, but they had a lot of frustrations to go through, sitting at a dock behind four other trucks that took priority over theirs. And not that the trucker's time's not valuable, but to them, they're, they're a one, two, three-man show. And so for them to sit on a dock and wait, just doesn't work out. And that was one that was expressed to me, specifically to Harris Teeter, that they were very frustrated that they spent so much time waiting. Um, and then, you know, the sales were not that large of a sale. Um, it it might have justified it that trip, but it was a lot of work. And the other thing, um, a lot of these uh, stores are relying on you to make that conversation and that call to the produce manager and you, you've got to develop a relationship. It doesn't take that out. It's just one man instead of dealing with 75 on a Saturday at a farmer's market. But you still have to make those phone calls and build that relationship. And some people just don't like that.
and just, I think picture perfect is everybody just picks it and drives it somewhere and drops it off. <laughs> you know, that just doesn't happen much. Um, and, you know, I think a good point here is that the, there's something to be said for the personality that just likes a constant. Um, I'll give you, this is not the best of example, but I have a, I've got two high tunnel greenhouses and I've enjoyed them. Um, but there's a lot of work in a high tunnel greenhouse and it's just, there's so much going on, it's intense and as extension, it's just difficult to get by and get things done when I want them done. It seems like I'm always behind. And so I've had an opportunity given to me to grow um, a, uh, you know, I can get, a, get about 1,500 hostas in three gallon pots for one of our big nurseries, Latham's Nursery, and they send them out west. And so they've offered me about half what I can make off of at retail, but the benefit of knowing that that guy's gonna drop off the plugs of hosta, I gotta have pots, I gotta plant, and he's gonna pick them up a year later, is pretty intriguing to me as an extension agent because it, it, I can just foresee how much more time I'll have. Um, so you, you have to admit there are a lot of people that fit this model and we, we just need to maybe help them figure out what type of wholesale fits um, for that person that likes the constant and really doesn't like juggling their, their income every day. Um, and so here's some factors uh, to consider when we, um, when we take a look at, uh, you know, what market channel, and I, and I think the one that was highlighted more than anything, actually through, uh, I think that was Hardesty that did the analysis of personality traits and uh, through a survey, and I'm butchering exactly what it says, but uh, essentially did a, a study on the different producers and asked them questions about why they had chosen the channel that they selected. And the two that really stood out were lifestyle preference and stress. That seemed to be the one that, uh, that people identified with. And I have to admit, um, we talk about all the other things because I think they're more black and white and they're easier for us to point to. But the lifestyle and the stress is the one that I think is where extension has the flexibility to develop a relationship with a producer and step in and try to start figuring out what does fit them. Um, and I think there's creative ways, something I'm interested in is, I think there's creative ways to work with producers so they can offset each other. Um, so maybe it's not a bad idea to get somebody that's a little bit tight and uh, stiff-necked and, and put them in there with a gambler, you know, and somebody that really likes to take a risk and, and get them in the same room, take them on a trip somewhere, uh, do something with them, uh, whatever we can uh, coerce them to do. But to get them to conversate and maybe see where there could be some middle ground, where they might could, uh, could join forces um, and, and find a market channel that fits. Um, I think the one that's more humorous than I think everybody else could identify, here it is, I forgot I had it in there. Um, I think everybody can identify with these. We have a ton of uh, overnight farmers come into our area, and I'm sure everybody else is starting to feel that too, but I feel like half of my job has become a uh, real estate agent. Um, people just call me wanting to find land, wanting to know what the, uh, you know, the policies are and what kind of requirements they have. And more often than not, I'll be honest with you, my gut feeling with meeting with the people is that they don't have the personality to farm. I, I mean, I hate to say that. Sometimes I feel like maybe I'm looking through a lens and I've got to be very careful uh, how I read people, but so many of them don't understand the stress of getting that product to market. Um, and I had one who I worked with for quite some time. His first go around, he planted like 1,200 peppers. He had all these connections with chefs. And he called me up in the middle of last summer. And I mean, he was cursing like a sailor. He was upset. Nobody wanted his peppers. It was the best peppers he'd ever seen. They'd stand up against anything in the grocery store. He just couldn't understand it, you know? And I'm gonna be honest with you, he wasn't the most friendly guy to deal with. And he just was, I'll be honest, the last thing I would want is him to show up on my doorstep with a, 
with a truckload of peppers because he just seems kind of forceful and he's not, he came from a landscaping background and he was dealing with contracts in big companies and the produce world just doesn't operate that way. So he felt like somebody was just gonna come by his field out and he'd sign a check and you know, they'd sign a check and he'd cash it and be done. Um, so this was actually uh, where they had went through and ranked the different um, avenues or the different market channels based on some different needs and, um, or, or different uh, criteria. And so it was interesting to see what kind of things other people actually identified the market channel as. So taking our hat off and letting them tell us what the benefits of different market channels are. Um, and I think this, yeah, it says 14 uh, fruit and vegetable producers. And so um, that's where they had come back and picked out stress and uh, lifestyle as being their main reasons for choosing different markets. What does that tell me as an extension agent? Um, the, for me, I work with these farmers markets so much, it makes me realize that often I have this economic um, perspective and I'm thinking business and I'm thinking success and I'm thinking about ways to make local foods a big deal in our area. And what I'm realizing is that the vendors I'm working with and the folks that I'm working with didn't choose that because it was a big deal and because it was really that profitable or that the economics made sense. The reality is, is that they wanted a lifestyle that was different. And so me barking at them and telling them how to make more money and how to better market themselves may not be the best approach. I, I might need to think more um, from their perspective. Um, so I think I'm just about ready to switch it over to you. Um, I think here, um, what I put this in for was mostly so that you could, when, when having this conversation, if this were a group of producers, I think the way I would pitch this to them is I would ask them some specific questions about which of these things creates the most stress in their life. And I, I think you'll find different answers from different people. Um, as a producer, weather doesn't stress me out. I've found in life that it always balances out. Something has drought, something does really well. I get this in really late because it was a late freeze and hey, my fall market does really well. And so it, it's just my personality more than anything. I just don't, weather doesn't stress me. But I can tell you that logistics stress me out big time. Um, so for me, trying to move that product and get it to someone on their time frame, and not mine, stresses me out. I second guess myself, I'm afraid that they're going to be really upset because it's 30 minutes late or I didn't have the exact quantity that I thought I had. And so for me, that keeps me out of the wholesale market a lot of times. I would rather deal with a chef because I found that chefs are fairly forgiving because they're really bad at it themselves. Um, they're almost never on time. They almost never know exactly what they need. So we get along really well, <laughs> okay? So I don't have that problem, but other people, chefs will drive them absolutely crazy because chefs are, have a high demand for their time. They, um, they don't really know what they need. They have to gauge it day by day. Um, and some people just don't like dealing with that. Um, so, uh, and there again, labor, stresses a lot of people out. I'm small, labor's not as big an issue, it's just how much sleep I want, okay? And uh, for other people, it's not about them. They, there's no way they can harvest enough and so they've literally gotta move. Maybe they have multiple businesses. I don't know how many of you have somebody that has multiple LLCs or businesses. So they're literally having to choose one business over another to move labor around to get it done. and that I could understand would stress you out. Um, so a lot of these kind of questions I think are things that new producers and producers that are diversifying often don't think about. And I think that's a good question when somebody comes in and they say I've got this deal I want to sell to MDI, all right I'm gonna get GAP certified, 
Ask them how long they want to go before they get paid, okay? Not that MDI, MDI is bad about it, but it's, it's not going to be a check when delivered for the most part, okay? Um, or ask them about the idea of something being rejected, okay? How are they going to feel when a truckload of something that they work very hard on is turned away because suddenly something, something happened, they couldn't move what they thought they could, or there's something wrong with your product in, in their eyes, it doesn't meet their standards. Do you want to live by standards? Um, I don't size and grade tomatoes. I just don't. I just like tomatoes the way tomatoes come out. So I'd have a real issue with somebody asking me to grade those. It's just not my personality. I would cry over all those lost tomatoes, <laughs> okay? I'm just, it, it's something I struggle with. Um, and then I have other, I have farmer's market folks that grade stuff harder than some of the folks that I have that do sell to um, a larger retailer that just do it because it's just their own personality trait. They're just uh, specific. So I think another thing that, um, and I was trying to think of a great example, but one of the conversations that uh, have occurred and you might find yourself pretty soon is people trying to figure out how broad of a market do they need to have? How far out do they need to go? And um, what can happen is there is a strong interest in a specific item that's a little rare, out of the norm. And I find a lot of people that jump into that without really thinking how far they're gonna have to go to get a, a broad enough market, enough people to provide them the demand to keep them in business, okay? Um, and it's very difficult. I was trying to think, the best example I could think of was um, I have a person that's growing stevia and they had a huge following of people buying stevia at the market. It takes a lot of stevia to make a business, okay? It's just, you don't use stevia in a large quantity. Um, there's a lot of people that just would rather buy it in a powder. They don't, they don't want the the, the green in something. They don't want to have to go through any type of processing or grinding or anything. Um, some of the people just don't know what it is. And so this person had carved a business out with stevia or they, in their mind, and they had three farmer's markets that they were rotating through. And they just saw this unbelievable um, potential to grow that business. And the reality is, I think in about six months, they had pretty much maxed out their market demand. The people that had it enjoyed it, but there wasn't a growing number of people that said, boy, I've got to have your stevia. Um, and a lot of people were satisfied with what their sweetener was. Um, so it didn't have the drawing of honey, okay? And you'll find in honey, people find you before you're ready to sell honey. It's just like people have this attachment to their local honey producer. So what I had to do is help her see the benefit in maybe getting in some health food stores that were close by that sold a lot of very specific items for people that were very cognizant of what they were putting in their bodies. And so she developed a pretty good little plan. They uh, had no real, <laughs> I don't mean that bad, but they just didn't have a lot of standards. These places hadn't dealt with a lot of farms. Um, and so she created a little product, she put it in a jar, um, started putting it out at spas. It, it was a whole list of places she had created. And, um, and she's done pretty well, but she's going now from right here where, uh, where I'm located. She was selling in three within maybe 10 or 12 miles. There were three farmer's markets that she was selling in. And now one of her stores is way up here in China Grove. And so she's really had to expand where she's going. Um, but a lot of what she has is dehydrated, it can sit, she, it's okay. She can deliver when she wants to deliver and it works out really well. So I think that's a good, um, it's a good example of, of considering how niche an item or how diversified you are may very well determine how broad a reach you have to have. With my CSA, I can tell you, I don't know why some of the people drive as far as they do to come get my produce. Like I had envisioned that I was gonna supply my local community. You know, over half of my uh, customers, at least half of them, drive 45 minutes to an hour to come and get it. 
And I've even had some that I tried to convince it wasn't worth it. Like I felt, I felt bad because I was trying, like I felt like I was gonna let them down. I was like, you're gonna drive an hour. Like I don't think I'm worthy. My produce is not that great. <laughs> you know, it's good, but, but I was amazed. There are some people that that's such a specific thing and, and so many of the CSAs have kept and they're not, they've got a waiting list. And so people are just trying to find somebody they can get on, uh, on their list. So um, in other areas, of course, we don't have that many CSAs in our area. Um, I could imagine throughout the state that might be the exact opposite. And a CSA would have a very small region that it would sell in or, or market. I, I just don't know how far people would travel. It would depend. Um, so we gave an example that, that I forgot about this was even in there, but I had another farmer that was wanting to grow uh, green beans commercially. Um, and the reality was we found out that direct to store sales was about the best that he could do because he could not compete price wise with a bagged frozen green bean. And that's what the grocery store saw it as. So they wanted fresh green beans and they wanted a batch delivered on a regular basis to 14 stores. Um, and then I have found shiitake mushrooms are so specific and there's so many people growing them now that boy, I've, online sales has been my ticket, trying to just uh, ship them and sell them anywhere I can. Um, so there would have a much larger region. And I, I would, I don't know any studies on this, but I would imagine the number of producers growing a similar item would also affect that region and how broad of a region you're going to have to go. I don't know what that, what that uh, coefficient would be. This one, this is a touchy subject, so I'm not going to go into a lot here, but understanding your cu customer and not what somebody has told you your customer is, that's a big kind of pet peeve for me. There are just so many people that are convinced of who their customers are because of media because of um, someone in their family they trust a lot that just has this gut feeling of, of who's gonna buy it and how big of a market there is for that. Um, and uh, a big one is organic certification. Um, my take on it, to be honest with you, it just doesn't fit a lot of people. I find in more and more there are people that just will never see the benefit out of having organic certification because they're selling to such a direct market and people that want to know them that they, the customers just really don't care, okay? And my own take, and this is not from the study, but this is just my own take, I tell people, if your face, the further your face is separated from the product, the more the certification matters, okay? So think about how that product's labeled. So if my eggs are sitting in somebody else's store, and my name's nowhere on it, okay? Then it becomes pretty important that they're graded, that they're told whether they're grass, you know, or range fed or they're pastured or whatever you're gonna put, claim, that's when those start playing a part. As long as your face is there and you can have a conversation, you've got a communication with that person, the certifications to me become less and less important, okay? You gotta really think through what that certification is gonna bring you. Um, and there are way too many people, it's not as much as it was for a little while, but I got a lot of people, and I'm sure you have, that received, they got this idea in their head somewhere that organic meant premium and more sales. That, that it was just a given. As soon as they put that logo on there, that they were just gonna skyrocket in, in sales. And what I've watched in my own experience is that it limits a lot of sales as well. There are a lot of people who are equally priced, who have a great product, and people will pass them by in our area specifically because they assume it must cost more. Or maybe they just have a personal issue. They just don't like whatever it connotates in their mind or what they relate it to. Um, and then I have others that, uh, I have one farm in particular that would not be in business if it wasn't for her certification. She's in Charlotte in a very high-end market, and she's one of two in that market that I know of that are organic certified. So it really helps her stand out. Um, but I think it, it just really depends, and I, and I ask them again and again, what type of person 
what kind of personality. And even if you disagree with your customer, you need to understand your customer because that can help you figure out what channel you're supposed to be in. All right? You're not going to convince most produce buyers on their organic, even if you're an organic producer. They want organic because of what it brings their store, not because of a personal preference. Um, so you might need to think in the way that they think, that it's, it's capitalist, uh, I guess is the best way to say that. Why don't we jump to yours, and if we have time, we'll, we'll go back over those. Wow, thanks so much. You, you have so much deep knowledge. Um, it's just fascinating. Um, I don't have the deep knowledge. I have um, kind of stepped back looking at, I work at Center for Environmental Farming Systems, and I work on different projects that have to do with this kind of building value chains and connecting small and mid-scale growers with um, larger markets. So that's kind of my experience. So I'll be speaking a little bit more. At, we don't work through this project, NC Growing Together, which is a project I manage out of CEFs. We're looking at small to mid-scale grower into retail grocery store chains like Lowe's Foods, which has been a, a partner of ours over the past three years to get more product into their stores. And the DSD, direct store delivery, has been a great channel for doing so. And then also we work with food service. So institutional food service or going through wholesalers into restaurants or university accounts. So what I'm gonna do is just, is just look at things just a slightly different way from the way, that, um, the way that Dustin looked at the market channel analysis. And we'll look at it through these different concepts of supply chain collaboration and upgrading. All right. So I love market channel analysis because a little bit goes a long way and it makes so much sense. And sometimes it's like Dustin said, you can have all these things and they seem almost, you know, like it's, it's obvious, right? But when you, you have to really walk someone through it one by one and get them to look at their price, look at, look at exactly what market are they good for? What is their volume? Should they keep growing and adding products or should they scale back and do five, maybe do one into wholesale and then grow other, others for retail market? So what combination of market channels works? So market channel analysis is great. Supply chain analysis, you know, and what I'll talk about supply chain analysis as far as collaborating and upgrading, we're just kind of standing back, like Dustin is over here looking at what the producer is doing, and this is looking at it from just a slightly different vantage point. So collaboration, we're considering all the entities along the supply chain, and how you as extension, edu extension agents or agricultural educators can work with different entities along the supply chain so that all gain, but especially producers, right? And then upgrading, we're gonna look at not so much um, the change of market channel, but how the producer changes what they are doing in some way, either doing more, doing less, or working smarter to be more profitable. All right, so here's our supply chain. So we got the producer in the middle, the distributor, final customer. So the distributor is anything that's in between the producer and the final customer. So it could be a grocery store, it could be a wholesale distributor, could be a couple of distributors that finally gets them to the final customer. So the supply chain, you have payments going this way and you have products going that way, simple supply chain. You don't necessarily have to have collaboration within this kind of supply chain. You can just be selling to people, you're just selling to a distributor. You, know, you don't have any, there's no collaboration other than I'm calling you, you're calling me when you need product. If we want to collaborate along the supply chain, then we're going to have information flow going back and forth so that I as a producer am working with the distributor, working with the grocery store. We can consider that to be the retail distributor. We're exchanging information. There's value in exchanging information because then we can plan ahead. You know, we can strategize. You can tell me, you know, you want to have some kind of event in the fall, you want to have pumpkins. You want to have a bunch of pumpkins. Oh, you want to have, I say, what, what about sunflowers too? You want to have sunflowers? Yeah, I could have sunflowers. So you're strategizing and planning for the future. But it takes time and effort to get that information going back and forth. So that's where uh, Extension or others who work with, with growers and along the supply chain can really play an important role in talking with the final, in talking with the customers, which in this case could be the grocery store manager, to find out, what, you know, what do you need? You know, what are you looking for? Go in and introduce yourself to all the grocery store managers, all the produce managers in your area, you know, as a, as a resource for them to find farms, to find farm products, to be involved with the agricultural community in their area. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so that is the role, I see the great role for extension, is to be that information gatherer and connector. And what you have to find out is what that buyer, let's say it's a grocery store, a produce manager, what do they need to make their business competitive? So it doesn't really work to go in and say, you know, you ought to buy from a local, local grower because, you know, it's really good for your community. Or this farmer has really good standing in the community, you ought to, really ought to buy, they may want to, you know, but if, it, if, it, if it's going to cause them to lose sales, lose profits, look bad to their employer, and possibly lose their job, they can't do that. So they're in the, a competitive marketplace. So it has to make sense for them business-wise. And it may mean starting out very small in an, an event-type event relationship, which could grow into regular sales over time. And that's what you can do is you know, help with that collaboration and get it going. So once you've found out what the store manager wants or what the food service representative wants, what they need so that they can be successful, then you can help make that happen by being the, a feedback loop between buyers and growers. So a grower won't always have time to go out and meet every produce manager. But you, in the course of your daily work, may be able to meet a lot of produce managers. Maybe if you're involved with the Chamber of Commerce or, or other, um, other business groups which are in your communities, you can meet everyone along the supply chain and be that you know, take that information back and forth. You can be the vetting intermediary. That means that if there are growers that could supply pumpkins to these 10 stores that are desirous of local pumpkins, you're going to make sure that the pumpkin grower that goes over to the store and says, I'm ready to supply you with pumpkins, actually has those pumpkins. Right? It's not someone who has never grown pumpkins before. Right? So that you yourself, as the, as the information holder, that you become to have great legitimacy and worth in the eyes of the buyer, and then they'll come back to you for information because, because they'll, they'll know that you're a valuable source of valid information. Shepherd early exchanges. So if you're working between, in between the farmer and the final buyer, you know, it's not just bringing them together and letting them go and off they go into the sunset and have a great relationship. Sometimes that first delivery, that first point of intersection can be difficult. So like what Dustin talked about, the truck coming up to the back of the grocery store and he had to wait. He had to wait in line behind other trucks. It wasn't worth his time. So that's something that maybe he just kind of threw up his hands and said, I'm just not going to sell that grocery store anymore. But you can go to the grocery store manager and say, you know, what about that? You know, he can't spend as much time waiting in his truck. And they may say, and this is what we've seen with Lowe's, is either you can come around to the front of the store because you have fresh produce. You don't have to wait behind the beer trucks in the back of the store because that's going to be bad for my produce at my market. Or they may say, you know, it, just talk to the receiver and the receiver can tell you what time, time of day is best to come. You know, when you can avoid all the beer and dairy and chip deliveries at the back. Involving the buyers and grower training, we've seen with NC Growing Together that this is a great way to establish relationships. So in the next session, um, Joanna and Robin are going to talk about grower-buyer networking events where you're bringing them face-to-face, -face, you know, so they can establish, like, and put their cards on the table face-to-face, -face, you know, what do you have to sell, you know, what's your price list, this is what I'm looking for. Sometimes it won't, those relationships won't gel, they won't necessarily establish a market relationship just from that one meeting. And they may call, so one, of, one may call the other, the farmer may call the buyer, the buyer may call the farmer. For some reason, they don't connect. Um, but then if you, they can see each other again in another setting, then they're like, oh yeah, you know, we meant to connect, didn't we? And they actually start to have a, start to have a relationship. So we've seen that by, we'll, in, we'll include buyers in our post-harvest handling training so that they're actually working hands-on next to the growers doing grading and packing. Or if you had a GAPS workshop, if you had any other type of workshop, you could invite the buyers to come. Buyers meaning produce managers from the local grocery store. Okay, so I'll talk for a few minutes about selling to grocery stores. Um, just because I have experience because we've been working with Lowe's Foods and we were talking about that a little bit. So the thing, the grocery store mindset is that the produce manager and the store manager, they want to please their customers. They, you know, it's, it's not just that they're they're there at the behest of um, the corporate entity to make sales. They have to deal with customers every day, and they feel like they know their customers best. And as Dustin said, maybe there's some recognition now at the corporate level that they do know their customers best, and they should be able to decide what kind of products they want to buy. So they have more decision-making um, autonomy at this point than they have in the past. 
but they also have to make their numbers. So what do you mean making their numbers? It means in the produce section, it's not even so simple as just to say they have to make some profit percentage. The way it works in the produce section is that there's a certain margin that they have to achieve, an overall margin. So you guys are all types of produce, and I am the, I'm the produce manager, and some of you are going to be on sale this week. And some of you are going to have to make up that difference. I'm going to have to keep that price high. One of you guys is bananas, and you've got to always be cheap. I'm never going to make money on bananas because a shopper always compares other grocery stores by how much the bananas cost. So I probably don't make any, any money on bananas, so I'm going to have to charge more for somebody else. And then there's going to be the corporate's going to tell me something's on sale that week. I'm not going to make money off of that. Okay, now I've got to bump up prices on something else. So the, what they've got to do is, is make their numbers and make their margin. So that's why the margin is pretty, is, it comes down, you know, 50%, 30 to 50% off of what a grower could make from selling uh, direct to consumer at a farmer's market. It's going to be quite a bit off. Like Dustin said, you know, the trade-off is that you don't have to be at the market. You don't have to be standing at the market every day. You can go and take large amounts of produce to a set number of grocery stores. Um, presentation at delivery. Your product will always be compared to what they get from the wholesaler. They'll continue to receive squash even when local squash is in season. They'll always be compared to that squash. They may be receiving, you may see that they have huge jumbo peppers in the store. You're like, well, I got, I've got peppers, but your peppers are slightly smaller. And you say, but they, they taste better. They taste better than your big peppers. But the way they've got peppers priced is at this like one for 99 cents. So they can't put your small pepper right next to the big pepper. They have to charge the same price if they're both loose peppers. There's just one, one code, POU code, for peppers. So see, they, it, it keeps them from being able to have your better peppers. So you might have to think about a strategic move that you could make so that you could sell that as a different item. So what if you packaged your peppers as stir-fried peppers and you put six in a bag and you said there were local stir-fried peppers? You know, this could be, be something that would be a, a different product and now it's not comparable to the big peppers over here and you can price it differently. So this is, this is something that extension education can help with by knowing these techniques and also bringing them up with produce managers and talking them through it and talking about different ways to sell product when a farm might not have the time to sit down and think about all those things. Um, on the store shelves, being present in the store, with grocery stores, they want you in the store. So especially if it's a value-added product, if you want to launch a new value-added product at the grocery store, you can deliver that direct to the grocery store, especially with Lowe's. I, I know that Lowe's will do that. You can deliver a product directly to the store, but they're not going to market it for you. right? You're going to need to go in every Saturday, every Sunday, and market that product to build up a following. Then once you have a following, then you can, can step back. That's a lot of time involved. Even if it's produce, they would like to have you come in the store. That's to the mindset of, to the grocery store manager mindset, that's how you build sales, is by doing tastings in the store. So that's what they're going to want to see. And if you, you can provide that, you know, like when you first go into the grocery store and say, you know, I have melons. I have the best melons you've ever tasted. And if you can catch them the year before and take the melons so that they remember you the next year when you come, then, and you say, I'll come in for events or every Saturday during the season um, to promote these melons. That's something that they're going to say, well, you really bought into this. I would like you to come into my store. Um, volume, of course, is a big thing. I mean, the fact that you can go direct store is going to be a lot easier because you can sell by the case instead of by the pallet that you'd have to do by going through, a, through the wholesale channel. Um, Fill-ins between warehouse shipments. We often think that, oh, the reason that a local uh, grocery store would want to have local product is because it's local, has that local thing on it. Well, it could be for a lot of different reasons, and one of them is is that you, a local grower can fill in in between warehouse shipments. That may be a reason. So this is another reason. So you really, you got to find out, you know, what do they need? You know, what are they looking for? How can I help you, you know, run your produce department successfully, right? How can we work together on that? Uh, prize local items, uh, as we mentioned before, like berries, peaches, tomatoes, that taste a lot better when they don't spend a lot of time going through a warehouse. And shelf life, really important. So as um, Dustin said, if the strawberries only lasted three days or two days, the last time you brought them in, they're not going to buy any more from you. 
The only way they will is if you say, I'll take all those back and give you the rest of these for free to kind of make up for that. Okay, so now I'm going to go zippity zip because we have two minutes <laughs> and talk about uh, producer upgrading. Okay. So upgrading, doing more activities or having more influence or how, over how your product reaches in consumer. Three types, functional, process, product. You can upgrade, you can also downgrade. It's not always better to do more. It's not always better to, to try and do more activities, grow more things, maybe you should grow fewer things, do fewer activities, concentrate, find your competitive advantage. So let's go quickly through the three types. So functional upgrading means that you know, we're back to our supply chain, you're the producer, and you're gonna take on some other function that is here. You might start providing your own, your own grain, like if you're gonna try, you know, focus on that in the supply chain, or you might take on the role of distributor. So this is what a lot of, what food hubs can seek to do, is this functional upgrading by acquiring the function of being the distributor. You know, individual growers can do that by delivering DSD to grocery stores, delivering DSD to a restaurant. But you really have to look at the trade-off between all those trips to individual restaurants and whether or not it would be better to sell your product through a distributor who's going to take all that, those products to the restaurants. So that's a functional upgrading. Process upgrading means looking at the business and doing what you've been doing, but more efficiently. So computerizing a, fun a function, adopting new production pra practices, um, identifying an effective way to communicate with your buyer is key. So one thing we don't realize about and think about too much is uh, what's called transaction costs. So the amount of time that it takes to do a transaction. So the reason that a buyer wouldn't want to buy from many small growers as compared to one big grower, even if the product from the small growers is better, tastes better, is that just takes too much time. And then there's this continually every week having to check in with that grower. So if you can figure out a better way to do that, and the better way may just mean every, the better way may just mean be every Wednesday at 8 a.m., the produce manager, I'm going to call the produce manager, he knows that I'm going to call. All right. Product upgrading, a different product or differentiate your product. So it's a better version. So here's some examples. I think uh, packaging is key. Packaging, um, providing a chopped product, not even a washed product, because then you get into different food safety things, but just a chopped product. Um, getting, some kind of ga getting some kind of certification, GAPS, or this is animal welfare approved, if you look at me. But of course, finding out, you know, like Dustin said at the start of his presentation, you may not know exactly where you're gonna sell it, but get a read on the interest, especially if you're gonna, if you're gonna invest in one of these certifications. Okay, summary, upgrading, downgrading, I have to finish up. Uh, final thoughts. So extension can be a conduit of information al along the supply chain, a, a, hugely, a, a, a hugely beneficial conduit of information, and can help growers identify their competitive advantage. We have on the NC Growing Together website a lot of different resources, and some of them are outside in, in a booth right around the corner, so different different things on uh, you know, understanding PLU and UPC codes, and a whole series on selling direct store delivery of different, different types of products. All right, thank you very much.